This episode brought to you by How to Write Manga, your complete guide to the secrets of Japanese comic book storytelling. Available wherever fine ebooks are sold. The world has gone insane. Cosplayers rule the conventions, gamers dominate the tabletop, and the internet. Sci fi subjugates the movies. And fantasy rules the bookstore with an iron fist. Only one group can bring order to this unruly mob. A team of uber geeks, masters of the nerdly arts, trained for decades in the hobby shops and basements of the nation. Mobilized by the secret masters, they are the Department of Nerdly Affairs. Hello, operatives, and welcome to the Department of Nerdly Affairs. I'm your host, Rob Patterson, here with my co-host, John Chisholm. Hey. And tonight, we have an extra special guest, comic artist, uh, animation director, writer, and producer, Will Minio, has dropped by to talk with us about his incredible career and how he was the man who was responsible for your childhood. Hmm. Welcome to the show, Will. Oh, well, thank you. And the thing about being responsible for your childhood, I feel like all of my friends could say that. (laughs) <laughs> you know, I, I, it was a good time to be in the business, and uh, you know, like my friends like Larry Houston and Keith Tucker, Rick Hoberg, and those guys all worked on the same shows. Mm-hmm. But, but yeah, it was it was a sweet spot in the business for me. Wow. Well, definitely. Okay. Well, and we'll get to that, but let's let's go rewind <laughs> a little bit in time here. And uh, so, tell us a little bit about your background. Where did where were you born? Where did you come from? Well, I was born in Washington State in the early 1950s, so I'm old enough to have retired now. Right. Uh, and then when I was in high school, uh, my mom got a job offer to come to California. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you were growing up in the 60s, California was the place to go, place to be as a kid. And we were so excited, and it turned out it was in Barstow, which is in the middle of the Mojave Desert. Uh, no place you know, like a couple hours away from Los Angeles. <laughs> so I spent my high school and junior college years in Barstow. But right. the good part of that was that uh, my wife to be, uh, Joe, mm-hmm. uh, her dad got a job at the Goldstone Tracking Center outside Barstow. And so I met the love of my life and wife when I was a senior in high school. That's awesome. Mm. So how long have you two been married then? Uh, let's see, we've been married since 1971. So it was 45 years this year. Wow, that was oh, the year wow. I was born. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, know, you know, time time really does fly when you're with the right person. And mm. Joe has had kind of a career herself in comics, where she colored. Oh, back when Disney and Warner's had publishing offices in Los Angeles mm. in the '80s and '90s, she colored just about anything with a duck or a pig or a mermaid <laughs> in it right. for their comics publishing line. And she actually has more comic book credits than I do. Smokes. <laughs> well, how did you get started drawing then? Uh, well, I'd always drawn and written since I was a kid. And uh, my original intention had been to be a writer. Mm-hmm. And uh, in the 60s, I had just a couple of pieces of correspondence from Marvel, and they explained how hard it was to break in as a writer. And then I had a script that Dick Giordano had held at Charlton for about eight months before he left, and he wrote me a really nice letter about how I had a lot of potential as a writer. But after that, I got thinking, you know, I can draw, and I think it it would be easier for people to judge your work as an artist, Mm -hmm. because it's right there in front of you. It's less subjective than being a writer, and so I shifted my focus over to drawing. Right. And so um, when I was in high school, I started getting work well, you know, fanzine work where mm-hmm. uh, I do like a few comics which are fanzines and things. And then around uh, 1972 or so, I started selling to some of the early, you know, not quite underground, but not quite mainstream books like Barbarian Comics and California Comics. Mm-hmm. And there was a tabloid in Los Angeles called OK Comics Company that I was in a few issues of before they shut it down. Right. Uh, at the same time, I'd be, I'd be doing samples to do for DC and Marvel, not really getting anywhere with it. Mm-hmm. And then I think it was in 1974, uh, Marvel did a little 
Android on DC where they suddenly bumped up all their comics to being 35 cents with more pages. Right. And you can see they were short on material and they were going to need a bunch of new artists and writers. And so I took that opportunity mm-hmm. and I did samples of all the characters I thought that they might be giving strips to. And so I did samples of Guardians of the Galaxy, Kazar, right. Nick Fury, Thing in the Torch. And then the one that hit pay dirt for me was I did uh, two sample pages of Tigra. Mm-hmm. Oh. And when they decided to give Tiger her own book, they didn't have anybody on staff who had the time to do the book. So they went through the slush pile, you know, the accumulation of unsolicited submissions, and I had the best Tiger pages. And so out of the blue, I got a call from Tony Isabella and asked if I'd be interested in doing Tiger. Mm-hmm. And as you can imagine, I was, <laughs> you know, I just couldn't believe my good fortune. So they told me to be ready in a couple of weeks to get my first script and start working for Marvel. And they sent me some paper and things. And and so two weeks passed. Then two months passed. Nothing happened. And I was so shy that I didn't know that I could just phone them. And finally, I, I pulled together my courage. And I called Marvel. And I asked for Tony. And the people in the bullpen said, oh, no, Tony's not here. Click, hang up. <laughs> so uh, another month passed, another month after that. And I, and I called. And I kept going, Tony's not here. And then... One day, about five or six months after I first heard from him, I get this call of blue, and it's Tony Isabella. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that he had gone over to Atlas Comics to work on their books like Grim Ghost and all that. Right. And he had not even been in the bullpen, and nobody there had had the courtesy to tell me that he had left. And so then I got to do my first Tiger, but... That was just kind of typical of the way Marvel <laughs> Comics was then, where if you weren't one of the insiders, you just weren't in. Right, yeah. Wow. And so I did two issues for Tiger of Tiger for them, and then Marvel had a uh, implosion where they just cut about 30% of their line. Mm-hmm. And being a weird guy from California that nobody knew in the office, I was like one of those people that got laid off. And so I had a few months without work. And then by fluke, uh, my friend Mark Evan, who I didn't know then, uh, went to New York and he was staying at Tony's appar- apartment. And Tony had Xeroxes of my Tiger pencils lying around. Mm-hmm. Mark saw them and liked them and uh, gave me a call when he got back to the West Coast because he was editing a line of Tarzan and Korak comics out of Burbank <laughs> right. for Edgar Rice Burroughs. And so I started working on the Tarzan comics and they got canceled. Uh, about uh, seven months you know, after I'd started on it uh, because they made the licensing deal with Marvel to do the Tarzan comics. Right. And so once again, I was out of work. And I didn't know what to do with myself. And I was doing a little bit of fan scene stuff here and there, but basically just starving. Mm-hmm. And uh, then Mark phoned and he said he'd just been at Hanna-Barbera, and this was uh, 1978. Mm-hmm. And because Star Wars being such a huge hit the year before, right. the network's all bought really heavy on Super and science fiction shows, and they didn't have enough talent that could draw human beings to do it. And I should film somebody at Hannah Barbera. Right. And he caught me away from my desk. I didn't have a pad and, pad and paper. I didn't get a name to write down. And I was too embarrassed to call him back and ask. So I just cold called Hannah Barbera and said, I understand you guys are looking for action adventure artists, um, and I'd like to speak to one of your producers. And I go, well, do you know who you would who you would like to speak to? And I go, no, I really don't. And they go, well. We have two guys. We have Don Jerwich, who was producing Super Friends, which I didn't know at the time. And we have Doug Wildey. And Doug's name I knew from the Johnny Quest from when I was a kid, because he was the guy that created Johnny Quest. Mm -hmm. And he used to have a signature card at the end of the show with Doug Wildey, you know, in script by his own hand. Mm -hmm. And so all the artists my age thought Doug was the coolest guy on earth. And so I got hold of Doug, and Doug was kind of abrupt with me. And I said, well, you know, I've done comic books for Marvel. He goes, well, why didn't you say so? Come on in. And so I went in, I interviewed with him, and uh, I got hired to be a layout artist on Godzilla. And that's kind of where my real professional life as an artist got started. Wow. So so Godzilla is the beginning of your career. Yeah. Yeah, in animation. Tiger is kind of the beginning in comics. But those days in the 70s, uh, there weren't that many of us on the West Coast that ever got a chance to do comics for DC or Marvel because there wasn't FedEx yet. And right. it was a difficult relationship uh, because it was expensive to deal with somebody long distance because you had to pay for the minutes on the phone. Faxes weren't really a thing yet. Uh, FedEx wasn't a thing. And so it would take weeks to have any kind of communication about work. Mm-hmm. And so 
it, in those days, that was kind of like a dead end after, you know, Marvel stopped using me for a while. And then about the same time I started working at Hanna-Barbera, Roy Thomas and uh, Steve Gerber had moved out to the West Coast. And I started getting a little bit of work from them. Mm-hmm. And that's how I started doing uh, pinups for Savage Sword of Conan. And the big thing about animation uh, was that there was a lot of work. Mm-hmm. It was based on the West Coast. And uh, you got paid uh, a salary rather than by piecework, and they paid your health benefits. And so uh, apart from a couple little veers off to do DNA agents and vanity, mm-hmm. uh, decided to kind of keep my career focused on animation uh, from about the mid-80s on. Oh, mm. Okay, interesting. Well, let's t- here, let's talk about your comics for a tiny bit more, and then we'll go to move to animation, because obviously yeah. that's going to be one of the main things we talk about. So... Um, the DNA Agents is probably one of your most famous projects, at least comics-wise, anyway. How did that come well, about? Uh, well, what happened was uh, the, the origin actually has to do with Dave Stevens and Rocketeer, because okay. Dave was a friend who lived in the neighborhood, and he used to work at uh, Marvel Productions' predecessor company, to Patty Freelang, mm-hmm. and had a good relationship with them. And so when he started working on Rocketeer, he got permission to use their copiers mm-hmm. so that he makes make Xeroxes to make his reference copies and things. And so one day Dave blew in and had uh, the first five pages of the first Rocketeer story mm-hmm. and was doing copies of them. And he told us about this whole independent comics thing and how you own copyrights and control your work and all that. And... And all of us on staff who've done comics were really excited by the notion of like Pacific and Eclipse and all those publishers coming up. And uh, and a couple of days later, when I was working on the Hulk cartoon, I really didn't care for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't like the clothes magically reappearing and all that. And then when I was having lunch with Mark, I bitched about it. and go, you know, maybe we should try doing a comic book. And so we went out for another lunch a few days later in Little Tokyo, and we just kicked around the idea that obviously at that point with uh, mm-hmm. Teen Titans and X-Men, a teen book was probably going to be the easiest sell and right. the most commercially viable. And so over the course of that lunch, we came up with our characters and their powers, and I went home and designed them. And mm-hmm. we spent a couple of weeks kicking stuff around, getting them named and things. Right. And I started doing development on them. Uh, while I was still working at Marvel. And then there was a strike in the animation business uh, that lasted for a couple of months. And during that period, I finished developing my part of the characters, and we did a five-page comic strip, and we went to San Diego. And I was kind of looking for work because, I was, like I said, I was kind of burned out on animation at that point. Mm-hmm. And I showed around the DNA agents' pages, and those days there were five publishers, and all five publishers expressed interest mm-hmm. Based on the rainbow pages in the DNA agent sample, uh, mm-hmm. DC had offered me Wonder Woman. And so I thought, well, maybe I should be a comic book artist. And so I took the plunge and dropped out of animation for a year and uh, did DNA agents. Mm-hmm. And then I, to when DNA agents was successful enough, that then I'd be able to sell a book all by myself, which was Vanity, which was right. the comic I always wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And so that all worked fine, except... Uh, in those days, the independent publishers just didn't have a cash flow where you never knew when you were going to get paid. Uh, it, it was a constant thing where I'd be working my butt off and I would never know if we'd have money for the rent that month. Hmm. Right. And when I was sort of falling to the last of my savings and resources from doing a year, uh, strangely, you know, like about a year and a half on a best selling comic, and, and about that time, one of my family members uh, was in an accident and uh, needed some help financially. So I called Marvel Productions and made a deal with them to work one day a week. I was making more, working one day a week for Marvel than I was working, you know, 30 days, 30 days a month uh, on the comic And uh, along about the same time, uh, I was having editorial issues with Eclipse where they wanted to start tampering with the artwork and being having more say in the stories, and they had deluded themselves that they had control over our licensing and stuff. And... I just realized I had enough, so I made a deal with Marvel to go back and do storyboards and st- uh, show presentation art. Right. And I was wow. kind of into DNA agents, and I thought I could keep Vanity going while I was back at the studio, but then Pacific uh, collapsed, and mm-hmm. it collapsed. It, it collapsed at kind of a serendipitous time for me because I'd been offered a chance to start producing and directing my own stuff at Marvel. Right. And so 
that was kind of the end of my full-time involvement with comics. Hmm. Wow. Okay, so that's why there's only, what, 16 issues of the DNA Agents? Well, there, there's actually a lot more of them. I did the first 14, and I did covers for s- several after that. But that first run of the book, 24 issues, and then there was a new DNA Agents that ran another 24. Right. And then uh, in the 90s, we had some interest from the network about maybe doing a DNA Agents show. Right. And so Mark and I put together a TV presentation that became the Antarctic uh, DNA Agent Super Special. Ah, okay. That's where that came from, uh, because I remember that. Yeah, and uh, and that was after, in 86 or so, DNA Agents had been optioned as a prime time series for CBS. Mm-hmm. And so that was another thing that was going on in the background all those years, too. It, was, uh, it took a few years before that really died. Mm. Well, was... um. The Dean Agents TV show, was that the one that eventually became Misfits of Science? Well, oddly, no, but but uh, Misfits, I think, really killed whatever chance we had. Uh, like, one of the jobs I did for a couple of years was I, I did the NBC ads that they had in the middle of the comics to promote their new season of cartoons. Oh, wow. And uh, I was doing the art for one of them, and I got invited to the promotion department at NBC, and uh, one of their guys was really excited where he showed me this property and he goes, wow, this is so great. This is like our version of the X-Men and it was Misfits of Science and they had the guy with the black leather jacket and the red t-shirt and the sunglasses throwing a lightning bolt in the picture. And I go, oh my, I had to keep it to myself because I was with right. my client and their boss and I didn't want to embarrass him. And I go, oh my God, that's DNA agents. When I, when I got home and I just didn't know what to do about it. The next day I was at the studio at Marvel, and Stan called me into his office and goes, well, do you know anything about the show at uh, NBC that's supposed to be like Fantastic Four? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and the problem was that actually it was NBC's reaction to CBS's DNA Agents uh, development, but they're two different yeah. shows. Oh, but, okay. but once they made Misfits, you know, we were dead. Right. Okay. Yeah, because Misfits did not go very well. I remember no. no, it didn't. But, but you know... It, it was similar enough that it had that same thing. It had a corporate setting for superheroes. Mm. They had the guy who was a dead ringer for Surge. They had the girl who was a dead ringer for Rainbow, who was played by Courtney Cox, who yep. would have been a terrific Rainbow, by the way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she would have been. That's true. And, and so, you know, the, if, if it had any life left, it was dead then. Oh. And over the years, uh, we've had... I, I think it's just one of those properties that's always going to be a bridesmaid, where we've had... Mm. Some, a few other chances to have it made uh, in animation, and it just never happened. Like uh, the last one was when USA was doing a cartoon block, right? Uh, and I was, and I was doing Exo Squad. Uh, somebody at USA Network was a fan of uh, DNA Agents and asked Universal if they would uh, see about securing the rights. Mm-hmm. It's an animated show, and so uh, we kind of got lost in the negotiation. The negotiation. T- took too long they had a shift of management and we were dead there too mm. wow That's too bad wow that yeah it would have been a great fit oh yeah yeah, yeah well then uh, strangely like the next year i wound up being street fighter for usa which was their most successful animated show while they had it huh. so okay then i guess we might as well shift back to animation then how did you go from Hanna barbera then to marvel studios well you know being a uh, being an animation worker uh, in those days particularly was a lot like being a migrant worker where you would just go where the crop was. Mm-hmm. And uh, a lot of the older guys were very embittered because it used to be that you would work on a show and you'd have three months of work and you have to make your living for the year from it. Mm-hmm. And when I got in, the market was just starting to shift where more of us started having year-round employment. And like those of us who could do series development as well as production – would generally have your round deals. And so that was fortunate for me. But when I was first at Hanna-Barbera, uh, I was closely associated with Doug. And then when Doug left, mm-hmm. I started working on Super Friends and The Thing. And then when those shows were done, uh, I got called in and give, I was given my layout notice, layoff notice, rather. Oh. And so I just went, to, went across town and had an interview at Filmation and got a job as a uh, supervisor of their action adventure storyboards. And so I wound up at Filmation first, and uh, 
then I was working at Filmation, and my friend Larry Houston had had a job at Marvel Productions doing storyboards on syndicated Spider-Man series they were doing. Mm -hmm. And they just sold Spider-Man and his amazing friends when one of that crew uh, had some family things that made them have to you know, stop working on staff, and so they needed a new storyboard guy. And so Larry recommended me, and the guy who was producing the show was Don Jerwich, who had been my boss on Super Friends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I quit at Filmation and started at Marvel for for the freedom of not having to work with the stock system at Filmation and also for the thrill of working at Marvel. In those days, uh, Marvel had a very small office. Right. And they, you know, like their in-house art staff was uh, Larry, uh, Rick Hoberg, uh, famous storyboard artist Dick Sebast, Russ Heath, mm -hmm. and me. And we were the guys doing all of the superhero artwork for the studio. And then Stan Lee was there, and so that's when I started having an acquaintance with Stan Lee. And uh, after I was there, I put up the splash page I'd done for Marvel Team Up 98 of Spider-Man. Mm -hmm. And Stan came by and goes, uh, you know, I really like this. Who did this? And I go, I did. And he goes, oh, well, would you like to try working on a newspaper strip with me? And so a few weeks after being there, I was suddenly ghosting a couple of weeks of the Spider-Man newspaper strip for Stan on top of working on the animation. Huh. So that was kind of like a dream job, and then they sold. Then when they sold the Hulk show, they asked all of us, you know, stop working for Stan and just start working for the studio. Hmm. So, but I did get in a couple of weeks of the newspaper strip, which was just an unbelievably great experience. That would be. Hmm. Now, was Stan drawing the newspaper strip or writing it? Oh, he was writing it. Like uh, Stan, Stan never draws. Like he can, he can draw a little bit. Uh, like I've actually seen him draw a few things and he's not bad uh, as a drawer for somebody who primarily writes. Right. Okay. It's, I'd always wondered that whether he actually had some actual artistic talent. I was never sure about that, but okay, thanks. That, that answers that question. Well, well, you know, he, I don't think that uh, he could commercially draw a superhero, mm -hmm. but he understands composition and design well enough to, uh, like when I was working for him at his own company, uh, uh, and we'd be pitching shows sometimes, Stan would come in with a little, you know, ballpoint pen version of a logo or something, and it was pretty good. Mm -hmm. huh. Well, that's all he needs, right? I mean, his main thing yeah. is about pitching ideas and pre presenting his ideas, not uh, not following them through, so that's all he needed to do. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, you know, back in the day, uh, you know, he he really edited a lot of stuff at Marvel, and he wrote dialogue for all the books and things, mm -hmm. and... Yeah, he's a very prolific man. So, a uh, question then. So, how did you end up on G.I. Joe then? Mm. Well, what, what happened is that, uh, okay, well, I was out doing DNA Agents. Uh, or actually, just before I started doing DNA Agents, Marvel had started uh, doing the G.I. Joe comic book with Hasbro. Right. And uh, one of the strategies for that was we were doing uh, television, television ads, which were supposedly for the comic. Mm -hmm. But were actually designed to promote the TV sh the TV show slash toy line that was coming. Oh, really? That's and what was so, going on. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and so uh, I'd been involved with the GI Joe stuff since it first came in the studio, and mm -hmm. just by fluke, uh, they were behind on the Spider Mans when I came in, and Russ Heath didn't have time to do the models, and Rick Hoberg, who was the other regular model guy at the studio, uh, was headed off to Korea. Uh, to supervise uh, some Spider-Man episodes because there have been some drawing issues on them. Mm -hmm. And so by fluke, I wound up doing the first, very first G.I. Joe animation models mm -hmm. uh, for the first commercial, which Rick had storyboarded, and then uh, Joe and I had colored it as part of the presentation to the sponsors. And then while Rick was overseas, uh, we did the layouts for the commercial there at Marvel, even though Toy was animating it. And so... Dick Sebast, Russie, Larry Houston, and I did the layouts for the first commercial. And then when the second commercial came up, they didn't have a storyline. And so they threw it to Rick and Larry and I to come up with something. And so we each pitched ideas and picked my, my commercial for the second commercial. Mm -hmm. And then before I left to do the comic, I probably did about five more G.I. Joe ads. And so when I took that, uh, you know, working at Marvel a day a week or four, mm -hmm. four days a month, the first thing they gave me was a four-day assignment to do the main title for the second G.I. Joe series. 
And so that was when I first started working on the Joe's TV show, as opposed to the commercials, was I did the second title for it. Right. And then when I started working on staff full time, one of the first things they gave me was the title for the uh, third miniseries. And, and then one for the actual series. And so I did both of those. And when they came back animated, the miniseries title wound up being so good. It was just right conceptually. And they had a really good team on a toy. Right. Uh, that wound up being the uh, title for the uh, first uh, season or two seasons of the Real American Hero TV series, besides yeah, the minutes. Yeah. 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 And so, so anyway, the way I wound up working at GI Joe on GI Joe at Marvel was that Marvel had been contracted by Hasbro's ad agency slash creative group uh, Sunbow to do, do pardon me, GI Joe Transformers, and then we did a bunch of other stuff like. The show that I got my first producing gig on, Gem, mm-hmm. and uh, in Humanoids and all those shows. It's been a really busy time. Oh, it was crazy. I think they were doing something like 500 half hours a year. Oh, <laughs> uh, I believe it. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so you find uh, situations like I was, I was working on Gem. Mm-hmm. Uh, they needed help finishing the first GI Joe movie, so. I was working on Gem by day, and then in the evening, I was storyboarding parts of the G.I. Joe movie, and I was also doing series development for them at night on, you know, shows that happened and didn't happen, and it was just crazy. We were all just so busy, and when they started Defenders of the Earth, they were shorthanded, and so uh, they asked me to come in and run the show till they found a temporary, so they found a permanent producer, so I was doing that some of the same time I was doing G.I. Joe and Gem. Oh, my God. You must have been run off your feet. It's amazing you had time to sleep. Well, I was younger, you know. Right. Uh, and as crazy as that was, like when we started X Men in 1991, mm-hmm. uh, I was also producing, producing and directing Conan the Adventure at the same time. And across the hall from Graz, where we were doing X Men and Conan, mm-hmm. uh, Ryan Yesna, the film producer director, had a studio, and he was starting production on. Return of the Living Dead 3. Mm-hmm. And we started talking one day. And I expressed interest in doing some storyboards. I said, well, would you like to try doing some? And so in addition to doing those two shows, uh, I was doing Return of the Living Dead 3 storyboards at night. Yikes. So just crazy. Well, it would kill me now. <laughs> but at the time, I was just so excited to be doing X-Men and Conan and then work with the live-action director I admired at the same time. Right. Yikes. Now, were you a big X Men fan, <laughs> like back in those days, or was this just something, just another project to work on? Well, I was generally a Marvel fan mm. in, in general, and uh, Larry Houston was a bigger X Men in particular fan. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I I had always loved Marvel. You know, like the, it was no coincidence I was sending my samples to Marvel more regularly yeah. than DC mm-hmm. because I just loved the Marvel characters, I loved the Marvel book. And when I had the chance to do X-Men, and particularly since we'd already done the Pride of the X-Men pilot at Marvel a few years earlier, mm-hmm. um, and this time we had the chance to do it right, I, I was totally excited. And uh, my role on it was I was the supervising producer, and because I was doing you know, uh, Conan at the same time, Larry was doing a lot of the day-to-day, well, most of the day-to-day production of the show, Mm-hmm. And I was kind of around to make sure it got set up and done properly. And because I was doing Conan, I had the financial freedom of I could afford to be fired off X-Men. Mm-hmm. So, so when somebody had to tell Marvel or anybody else that was interfering with the production of the show to back off, I would just do it because I could afford to, I could afford to lose the job. And wow. Strangely, uh, my financial strength from doing Conan at the same time is one of the things that made X-Men into the show it was, in that uh, I had the ability to say no to Marvel without any fear of them being able to punish me. Right. Huh. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that, and actually, uh, one of the things I'm helping out with a little bit now mm-hmm. is my friend Eric Lee Wald, who is the story editor on X-Men, is working on a behind-the-scenes book that's going to come out uh, the summer of 2017 uh, in time for cons. Mm -hmm. And we've been doing a lot of uh, interviews and reminiscing about this. And it's really an exciting period and and fascinating. And Eric 
was fastidious and kept all the paperwork. <laughs> and so uh, it's going to be an amazing book, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah I bet it is. I'll look forward because, to reading that. <laughs> because uh, one of the big things that happened with that show, mm-hmm. it's, it's the first time that Marvel fans got to run a show, uh, because Larry and I were both big Marvel fans. Uh, Sydney Iwanter, the network oh. exec in charge of the show, was a Marvel fan. And Eric and uh, the the Edens brothers had both read Marvel comics when they were kids, although they were more science fiction than straight comic book fans. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were easy to steer onto the path of how to do a Marvel show correctly because they already kind of knew them. Mm-hmm. And in those early days, uh, Marvel was actually the biggest problem because uh, they didn't understand the reason that most of their TV shows had not been successful to that point was they'd never had the confidence to do an actual Marvel show that felt like a Marvel comic and had the complexity mm-hmm. of a Marvel comic. Hmm. And so in the early days of, of the series, it was a constant fight to keep them on track. But yes, we're doing something that's more like a Marvel comic than anything you guys have ever done for film, and they just didn't get it. So the ones you had to tell to get lost were mostly the Marvel executives. Yeah, because <laughs> uh, this, is, this is one of those rare cases where Sydney was our network guy and Margaret Lesh was the head of the network, and they got it. They understood that they needed to have a show run by fans to get what was right about Marvel in the first place. And so uh, Sidney was a fan himself, and I was a fan, and Larry was, and we just kept the show on track to make it like the comic books we loved when we were kids. Right. Hmm. Now, what was the story, since you would obviously know, about when X-Men, the, the animated series, when the first episode aired, if I remember right, it was incomplete, wasn't it? Like, didn't well, it, did, uh, it, it didn't have retakes in, so okay. there were some scenes that were not, uh, that normally you wouldn't have aired, but they needed to have a presence on, on air to demonstrate that the show existed, uh, because there were production delays overseas, and hmm. um, they really made a courageous decision in holding off showing it as a series because it was costing them money every week because they guaranteed ad- advertisers there'd be a new show there and there wasn't a new show. And so they had to rebate, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars to advertisers while they waited for the show to be ready to air. Wow. Okay. That's, so that's what happened. Okay. And, yeah. And, uh, and, you know, one of the things that, that happened with X-Men is well, we're going back over Eric's notes. We had our first meetings on X-Men, I think, in February. Mm-hmm. And we were originally scheduled to be on air in September, mm-hmm. which which meant that we had to get a series uh, formatted, designed, uh, get through all the political rigmarole of setting up a new show uh, overseas and get the animation back. Uh, you know, we had something like a 13 or 14-week schedule overseas, which just wasn't enough for a show that complex. So what happened uh, is when we got the first episode back, it was rough and it didn't look nice. And uh, again, if when you see Eric's book, there's a lot dis- a discussion about this. But basically, uh, one of the places where Marvel stepped up and was a hero on the show mm-hmm. was the show when the animation wasn't looking right. Uh, they rolled over the money they were getting from the show into the production budget to mm-hmm. make it look better. And uh, and again, you know, even though I bitch about them creatively. <laughs> As a business thing, uh, they got that they needed help the show be better. Right. They saw the show was going to be a flagship for them, that it needed to succeed, and they were willing to put the money into it. Yeah. Yes, so they actually they actually helped when they didn't have to. Right. Now, here's a odd, another odd question. Oddly, again, enough again about the X-Men pilot, but it's been a little while, but I remember the character of Morph in the X-Men pilot dies. You have an actual character die in that pilot. Yes. And that was probably one of the first times a character had, di- an animated character had, in a superhero cartoon had died, like in the first episode, a member of the well, team. Well, that was one of the things that I'd insisted on that we do, because uh, I knew that coming out of the gate, we had to demonstrate we were different from what anybody had seen before, and that we were doing it differently than we'd done prior to the X-Men, uh, when we were under Marvel's thumb. Mm-hmm. And originally, we were going to follow the comics and have Thunderbird, and have him get killed. Oh. But about that time, uh, Marvel had a scandal from that, that god-awful NFL Super Pro comic uh, where they had uh, used some uh, Native American symbols uh, in, a, in a way that 
the Native American community found offensive. Right. And so there was concern that if we had Thunderbird killed, mm. you know, even though it was faithful to the comic continuity, that it would uh, look like Marvel was trying to get back at the uh, that backlash they'd had on Super Pro. And yeah. so, so we were stymied for a little bit. And so we sat down together and we came up with the character of Morph as a throwaway character just to do for the first episode. Mm-hmm. And so we got the script through, got the storyboards through, got him killed, and then uh, standards, broadcast standards and practices. You know, the, uh, the censorship of the network people started having second thoughts about whether we could really kill a character because it just wasn't done. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And so we made a deal that we would bring him back, uh, but later in the season so that people would really think he died. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, Strangely, what happened was because Morph had died and uh, he had created such a vivid impression as a character in the short time that he was in that first episode, mm-hmm. he actually became a real character and broke out and people were happy to have him back and didn't mind that we cheated that he'd been killed. Right. I mean, the uh, fact on my office wall here, uh, one of the things I have in my little X-Men toy case is the Morph toy because it's the <laughs> most unlikely thing to ever ever gotten made into a toy because we never intended him to be more than that one shot episode where he got killed. Right. Wow. Yeah, that's kind of weird because uh, in the very, 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 very early X-Men, uh, they had Mimic. And I know a lot of people thought in the cartoon that Morph was kind of supposed to be Mimic. No, he, he was just supposed to be the a, a well, he was cannon fodder, you know. <laughs> Wow, but uh, but I guess we did our jobs well enough that he ended up being a likable character, and it wasn't obvious he was going to be a throwaway. Right. Wow. Because I've I've wondered um, because you mentioned uh, when the X Men came out, you wanted to show it was different, but I think back to like the Marvel Sunbow days, and specifically GI Joe, um, when the ads came out and when the 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 show itself came out, it didn't look. Like any other any other television animation at the time, it was it was like visually darker. Uh, there was more detail. There were attempts at different angles. Like, uh, where did that idea come from? Well, I think, well, I think everybody wanted to do something different. And you have to remember, like uh, the GI Joes were developed by Larry Hama at Marvel Comics, so it had a big comic book influence to start. And the scripts were written by people who were comic book fans. Mm -hmm. And uh, those of us who were involved with the production and design were all comic fans. And I think everybody agreed that there hadn't been anything done like a comic book at that point for TV. And the goal with shows like Transformers and G.I. Joe was to do something that felt more like a comic book. And if you look at the credits on the shows, uh, a large portion of the American staff on the series... Uh, our comic book artists, comic book writers. And then when it went overseas, they went to a toy in Japan, so it has a little bit of the anime feel on top of it. Mm-hmm. Right. And uh, one of the things that was going on was that uh, particularly Larry Houston and I were anime fans where we'd started looking at the toy stuff early on when they, were, when they had things like uh, Force 5 and, uh, oh gosh, uh, Battleship Yamato and Captain Harlock in those shows. And so we were studying the Japanese and learning how to do their camera technique. Okay. And, and so, like when we were doing Spider-Man and his amazing friends and those shows, uh, we were having a lot of uh, headbutting with the guys who were directing the shows, who were former Disney directors and animators who had then worked for the Patty Freeling because we were trying to open up the camera. And uh, John Jerwich also wanted to do things, who was the producer, wanted to do things more Mm film-like. And when we would come in with some of the Japanese-type shots, like having animating foregrounds working against diagonal panning backgrounds, things, they would say that's impossible, and then we bring in proof of concept from (laughs) Shosuits. And so a lot of what was going on was there was a combination of the comic book influence and the anime influence, because uh, all of us wanted to do something better. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. And, I've uh, always wondered about that. Yeah, and so uh, we all took those shows like G.I. Joe and Transformers as being a chance to, you know, liberate the, sh- liberate the camera, liberate the show. And because they weren't for network, 
they weren't as heavily censored. And so mm. you were able to do more action and more intense action. Yeah. Yeah, that explains it too, because like um, for the, the Marvel Sunbow stuff, when they were doing the shows that were done, um, oh, I can't remember the name, but they'd be, be like a Gemini and Humanoids and that that were done as shorter oh, segments. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like those ones, when you say that you guys were trying to do comic book type stuff, you really see it in those because they're paced like a Marvel comic at the time that they start in the middle of the action, stuff happens, and then they end in the middle of it. And you're like, oh, what are you stopping there? I want to see what happens. Yeah, well, when you look at the crew, like, for example, on G.I. Joe and Transformers, uh, like they had guys like Buzz Dixon, and Flint Dilly, and Roger Slifer, the creator of Lobo, was one of their main guys who hmm. I worked with a lot on the G.I. Joe stuff. Uh, and then when we started doing Gem, uh, Roger was the Sumbo guy on Gem. And uh, he and I became very close friends while we were doing those shows. And then Gem was actually formatted and created for TV by Christy Marks, another comic book writer who'd done Sisterhood of Steel for Marvel. Hmm. So, so yeah, those were, those were kind of like those breakthrough shows for those of us who had done comics to finally be given some room to do what we wanted to do. So I can see, I'm just looking at your uh, your IMDb entry here, and um, I noticed you also worked on the real Ghostbusters for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, how did that come about? Well, in, in 1987, uh, the syndication market that had been supporting shows like Transformers and G.I. Joe was starting to fall apart. Right. And uh, Marvel had been trying to get a block of action adventure shows off the ground, and, which at one point had Captain America, and I was uh, art directing a RoboCop series for it, and Michael Yuzum had created a new version of Captain Video that they were trying to get sold for it as well. Right. And uh, the financing on those shows suddenly fell through. And so I'd been on vacation. I got a telegram when I got home, and it said, uh, come by the office and pick up your stuff. Like, we're done. You know, oh. and so, oh. so I picked up my stuff, and then uh, then I heard uh, from Kevin Altaria over at Deek that mm -hmm. uh, they'd started the Alf show, and they needed somebody to take over Ghostbusters, and it was going to be animated by Toy. Right. And I built a close relationship with the people at Toy while I was working on GI Joe and X Men, and right. they gave me the uh, the animation crew that I'd had on Pride of the X Men. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I got it was because I was available, needed the work, and uh, I'd done that. And actually, Pride of the X-Men is what got me Ghost, Ghostbusters. Actually, we yeah. should mention Pride of the X-Men as well. So that was, how did Pride of the X-Men come about? Sorry to keep – I'm just curious about many well, of these shows, and you were right there for it. Yeah. Well, you know, like when you look at Pride and uh, Defenders of the Earth mm – -hmm. Uh, that was Marvel's attempt to start doing shows that they owned and were financing and controlled the uh, production and toy money on. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so they'd uh, done Defenders with King Creatures, and they, you know, had a co-interest in it, co-financed it, I believe, and mm -hmm. uh, sharing in the toy revenues. And they decided to try a similar thing with X Men, uh, all out of Marvel's pocket. Right. And so, well, what happened was. Uh, they Stan thought it would be good to try doing it like a Marvel comic where he would work with the artists and we would storyboard it and then we dialogue over the storyboard. And we all thought that was a great idea. And so uh, Stan called in, uh, again, Rick, Rick Oberg, Larry Houston and I to you know co-produce and direct the show. Right. So we started work on it, developing it. And I'd actually come up with the first premise for it, which wound up being... <laughs> What was the what was the basic story that we used later in the real X Men cartoon, like four or five years later? Of of uh, in that case, Kitty Pride came to the came to the X Men X Mansion, had an adventure, and uh, I'd originally plotted it to have the Sentinels as the villains, mm -hmm. and we were about to go into production with that when Marvel hired a new toy consultant and said, "No, you can't do just these big robots. You have to introduce." all of the Marvel villains so we can show that we can have, you know, a big toy line. Mm. So uh, story-wise, I think that's where that fell apart because mm. we had to introduce, I think, 16 characters in 22 minutes, and it was just <laughs> too much. Right, yeah. And yeah. and then at the same time, there were other things that happened creatively with it, like 
with Wolverine doing the Australian, Australian <laughs> accent because New World was thinking about doing an Australian Wolverine movie. And oh, that's why that happened. <laughs> I was wondering. Yeah, yeah. And, and at that point, I was still, you know, it was like my second project where I'd been given a producer credit on. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know when I had to say no. Right. And so, uh, and so, uh, this is where Ghostbusters kind of influences X Men quite a bit. While I was working on Ghostbusters, uh, I had the good fortune of working with Michael Gross, uh, who was a Ghostbusters producer and had been the art director on National Lampoon. Hmm. And uh, Mike actually taught me a lot about being a more effective producer and learning where you had to draw the line when people want to do, wanted to do stupid things to your show. Hmm. And so, after doing Ghostbusters and Captain Planet. When the time came for me to do X Men, I was a much better, stronger producer and knew when to say no. Mm-hmm. But anyway, with Pride, uh, Pride was actually probably doomed before we started it because, like I said, the syndication market was falling apart, and there was just no place to put the put the show, even if they gotten financing for it. Right. And it wasn't till Fox Kids came along and Warner Brothers started producing their own shows that the market opened up enough. To sustain shows again, and so like if you look at 1970, 77, 78, 79, there are a lot fewer shows than there were before Fox Kids got active. Right. Yeah. And you think you mean 1987, 89? Don't. You? Oh, 87. I guess you're right. Yeah. Oh God, it's the senility kicking in. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yes, okay. you're right. It's 87, 88, 89. That, and also. The other thing that was happening was besides uh, toy sales cooling off, ratings on the shows cooling off, right. is uh, the local stations started reclaiming afternoon time slots for news. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. And so there were just fewer places to put shows. Because I do remember that, that um, you did seem like after G.I. Joe, there was a big boom in the afternoon shows. They cut back, and then it wasn't until, uh, like you said, the Fox Kids, uh, WB started they kind of brought back Saturday morning and it seemed like for, for a few years in the nineties, that was the, the big place for animation. Yeah. Cause I remember like uh, a year before X-Men, uh, I was working at Marvel productions uh, where I had kind of a sweetheart deal where they were paying me producer salary, just to sit around and do storyboards in hopes they sold one of the Marvel shows. Mm-hmm. And they tried to force me to take on uh, space cats by the guy that created <laughs> Alf. Okay. And, and I hated that show, <laughs> and uh, and I didn't like the guy, Paul Fusco, the guy that created Alf. I didn't care for him, and I turned it down. And it turned out that was the last season NBC had Saturday morning shows. And so they had spent nothing on the show and, mm-hmm. you know, disappeared after 12 episodes or so. Mm-hmm. But uh, it was just weird being there and seeing everybody kind of knew that was NBC's last season. Mm-hmm. Now, you mentioned, you know, did you learn to stand up for yourself and, you know, to, to say no and such. Did that come into a play when you were doing Captain Planet and the Planeteers? <laughs> uh, yes and no. There, 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 are, there are some things that I think are better than they might have been if I hadn't been there. Okay. Uh, but but um, that was kind of a different deal because it was uh, Ted Turner's money and his people right. really, to a degree, ran the show. Where, uh, while I did have a considerable amount of input into it, uh, it was mainly on the artistic side mm-hmm. and less on the story side. And that was also the show that I s- decided would be the last thing that I did, that I didn't have some significant influence on the writing. Right. Um, so Ted Turner himself was actually involved, or did he have his like pet writers that were actually doing it? How did that work? Well, what happened is that uh, Ted had come up with a concept, and... And he had uh, his in-house environmental unit development develop it as a TV show. Mm-hmm. And uh, my favorite person in the Turner organization is Barbara Pyle, who is mm-hmm. who has had, it was like a female Indiana Jones, basically, where she mm-hmm. is a woman who lived the life, went out the world, went out in the world, and she's an environmentalist who walks the walk and talks the talk. And if there's just about anything impossible any place in the world that a human being has done, Barbara has done it. Wow. So she was their executive in charge of planet. And 
and I love Barbara and still love her. Like we still stay in touch on Facebook and stuff, even though we're both kind of semi-retired these days. Right. Um, but, but really it was uh, Ted Turner's baby. And at one point they kind of had a competition about which studio was going to get it. And at one point Ruby Spears thought they had the show. And then somehow Andy Hayward at Deke uh, got the show away from them. And they were looking for producer, uh, because Ghostbusters, when I took it over, shot back up, up to number one in the ratings. People knew I'd done comics. Uh, I got handed Captain Planet as well. And so I was very heavily in, involved in the design and some of the conceptual things, but the stories were kind of just what they were. Hmm. Where right, yeah. It's one of those ones where I kind of wish that they would have uh, been more daring and more mature with the writing, but... Uh, <laughs> I don't think the show would have gotten made and distributed if they had. Mm-hmm. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, because so there was no way it could win, really. Well, you know, at the end of the day, Captain Planet, you know, it, it's strange for people who were too old for when it came out, but uh, for people who were like six, seven, eight years old when that show came out, it, it's like a major thing. It's it's like their Transformers of GI Joe, where they really love that show. Right. Hmm. But it was, but it was uh, designed to skew younger and designed in such a way that it would play internationally, yeah, despite translation and all that. And so, in some ways, it succeeds on its own terms. But again, I think, like most people, I wish it had been a little bit more of a superhero show, besides being an environmental show. Right. Yeah. Hmm. Sorry, Don. Interrupted you. Did you have something you want to ask? Oh, well, I was just thinking. Um... When you talk about that, another show you work on, you worked on that seemed to sort of go the other way. And I've always kind of, I've kind of wondered was, uh, you did some work on Bucky O'Hare. Uh, yeah, well, Bucky, <laughs> Bucky in my life came up at one of those weird points where uh, I'd hit burnout because I, I'd been doing Captain Planet and uh, and Ghostbusters at the same time. And there were times when I was delivering four episodes a week and. I just hit burnout, and, and when the, when course. Captain Planet and Ghostbusters hit post, I asked to be allowed my contract so I could get some rest. And they offered me uh, a chance to produce Bucky O'Hare, and it was one of those strange situations where Marvel offered me the gig for them, mm-hmm. Sempo offered me the gig for them, and uh, Neil Adams uh, offered me a chance to be their supervisor for continuity. Mm-hmm. And so because everybody kind of thought I might be the guy for it, I was offered a chance to supervise the show and go to France and oversee everything. Uh, but when we got serious about negotiating, I realized that I was just still too tired to take it on, and so I consulted on it a little bit. But apart from doing a few storyboards and being involved with initial design, I didn't take the show. Because mm. that was when I always thought, um, when you watch it, it looks like they wanted to do like another kind of Ninja Turtles, but then mm-hmm. they got they got into the stories and they did some heavy, bleak, dismal story. Because when you get there's one I remember with Bucky's origin, where they actually show the Toads like torturing and enslaving the citizens, and it it looked like one of those things that one group working on it wanted to do like the lighthearted thing. The other group wanted to do something a little more serious, and you get this strange kind of in-between thing from it. Yeah, and uh, see, that one I wasn't as intimately involved with, so I'm not sure of all the all the wheeling goings-on behind it. Because mm-hmm. I was involved in the very, very early stages of helping set up design for it and, and that stuff. But uh, by the time it went into production, uh, I was at Marvel doing other stuff like uh, helping develop the god awful Siegfried and Roy and things like that, while I waited to see if they could sell a Marvel show. There, there was a Siegfried and Roy. Well, th- this is one of those shows that everybody in town uh, took a stab at developing Siegfried and Roy, including Marvel. Mm-hmm. And Marvel, as far as doing, I think, uh, uh, four or five minutes of animation. And it just didn't happen, didn't happen, didn't happen. And then finally, uh, at some point, Fox Kids did a five-episode miniseries that mm-hmm. was animated by TMS, but it was just never a suitable premise for a kids' show. <laughs> uh, I don't remember it at all, but... <laughs> yeah, well, it was again, it was a miniseries. It was here in 
here and gone, and it pretty much just got buried where it was done more out of a sense of there was an obligation to do it after spending all that money on development on it. Okay. Wow. Huh. I don't remember it either. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. I didn't remember it until I was going through some papers, uh, <laughs> and I found a couple of pages of storyboard from it that I had done, and I was going through some pictures, and I had a picture of some Siegfried and Roy storyboards on my desk and on Larry's desk. And it's like, oh, yeah, we did that. <laughs> right. Oh. Okay, so it's one of those things where many people in, in your industry have stories about working on different versions of it or being involved with it at one, at one step or another? Yeah, yeah, where I think I know, again, that was one of those ones I know Ruby Spears was trying to do, uh, Marvel was trying to do, I believe Deke took a stab at it. And it's like Captain Planet where because there was – blood in the water everybody wanted a piece of it and so everybody took a stab at doing it wow one uh question i noticed that i was looking at your resume that you worked on uh, gi joe the movie is that correct yeah yeah i did the storyboards for it oh, uh, i've always had a question ever since i was a kid and i saw gi joe the movie because i was a you know young teen when it came out and everything like that yeah you were the you were the target demo i was the target <laughs> demo exactly so i always wondered something at the end you know, the character of Duke seems to die in it. And then at the end, suddenly there's this announcement that comes out of nowhere that says, hey, guys, he's going to live. Everything's OK. Yeah, that was uh, well, what had happened was some had originally secured financing and distribution for a series of animated movies. At one point, there was even potential discussion of there being a gem animated movie. But the first movie out of the gate that they actually released to theaters was uh, My Little Pony, and My Little Pony didn't do very well. And then Transformers okay. came out, and as you might recall, Transformers, uh, I think they killed... Everybody? Killed Prime. Yeah. yeah. And they had such bad negative feedback from it, and plus the movie uh, didn't ever actually make it all the way into theatrical distribution. I mean, they only had a couple of screens mm -hmm. in L.A. at a theater for the crew. Okay. Uh, that they slashed the financing on G.I. Joe about a third, in, third of the way into production. It became a TV movie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in addition to cutting the production budget, they realized that they couldn't kill a major character, even though it was already in the works to kill him. And so they did the voiceover to hide the fact they killed him. Okay. <laughs> I just always suspected it was something like that, but I was never sure. So thank you very much for, let, for telling me that. That's one of those <laughs> oh, no. Uh, uh, no he, he was supposed to be dead. You know, it was, okay. he got, I, I believe it was that uh, a Serpentor made a, uh, made a snake into a rigid spear-like object and yep, yep. speared him. Yeah. It. Yep. Yeah. Right in the heart, as I recall. <laughs> yeah, it was really obvious that he was dead, yeah. which is why it's such a shock when well, suddenly, oh, Duke's going to be okay, everyone, it's great. Well, yeah, and then there was uh, the bit with... Uh, Gosh, I think it was the female Dreadnought where she actually had a nude scene when it was going to be a theatrical, and then it got toned back for the TV release. Oh, wow. Huh. But, it, you know, it was a, a chaste nude scene. It was like James Bond nudity, you know, where you didn't yeah. see anything, but she was clearly naked, and they scaled that back when it became a TV movie instead. Wow. Okay. Well, yeah, I can see why they do that. Yeah. Uh, well, Cause... Okay. Because you've mentioned, you just mentioned something that it brings one weird thing to mind. Was uh, you mentioned when Marvel did the My Little Pony movie? Mm -hmm. You wouldn't happen to know whose idea the bad guy in that was, because that was clearly Asmodeus. That was the villain in the little cutesy pony movie. Uh, no, actually, you know, Marvel was doing so much stuff. Like, uh, there was a point at the time that they were doing Marvel at the the movies that Marvel had three offices. They had the they had the the main office that was on Sepulveda, and then they had two two offices by Van Nuys Airport, Marvel one, two, and three. Mm -hmm. And generally speaking, you didn't have the opportunity to hang out with people uh, when you weren't working on their shows. Hmm. And you know, like for example, when I was working on Gem we had our bullpen next door to the G.I. Joe movie. But up until the point that they needed help on the Joe movie, apart from my being friends with the guys working on it, I didn't really have any editorial contact with the Joe movie. Right. Hmm. Hmm. That makes sense. 
Now, was was that intentional, or did that just sort of happen? Oh, it just happened. We were all working so much. Mm. You know, we, again, I, I think, like I said earlier, I think they were doing something like 500 half hours in a year or year and a half at that point period, and it was just crazy, you know. Mm -hmm. Like, um, in fact, it, it was funny when they when they opened the Marvel 3 offices, uh, most of the action-adventure guys wound up in Marvel 3, and they had like a, like a tier of office that, offices for all the storyboard guys that went around the upper rim of the building and mm -hmm. the whole business not just marvel was booming where there was more work than anybody could could possibly staff to do and so you'd hear like somebody would get a phone call and they take turn down the job then you hear the next phone ring then you hear the next phone, <laughs> then you hear the next phone because there was just too much work uh -huh. <laughs> wow yeah they just go from person to person until they found someone yeah wow that's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> of course, those good days didn't last very long. You know, like when it fell, when business fell apart, it fell really hard. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I could definitely see that. Okay, so let's move on a little forward in your career. That so, how did uh, Exo Squad come about then? Mm. Well, uh, and this this gets kind of to X Men again because like I've been doing X Men right. and Conan, and I'd finished those, and on Conan. Because it was being produced by Sunbo and Marvel was just in charge of the pre-production, uh, Sunbo took the post themselves. So I didn't really have a job on Conan for post apart from helping with retakes a little bit so I could do a little consulting on it. And we'd finished X-Men and uh, there was no guarantee there was going to be a second season of it. Uh, but everybody was good and kind of keeping me on retainer, helping out with stuff at Graz even though they didn't have the money for me uh, until the show came in for post-production. And uh, Jim Graziano had been offered a job over at uh, Universal. So Jim went to Universal, and it turned out they were developing Exo Squad, and so he recommended me. I went, and I met Jeff Siegel, who'd created the show, and the guys at Playmates, and we all got along, and they offered me a chance to do the Exo Squad pilot. Right. So I did the Exo Squad pilot, and in the meantime, uh, X Men had become this huge hit. And people wanted me to come back for X Men, but then Exo Squad had been picked up. Right. And, and as I mentioned earlier, even though I'm a huge Marvel fan, uh, Larry was more of the X Men fan than I was. And I thought, you know, really with X Men, I've said what I have to say about it. And my next thing was I really wanted to do an anime style show like Exo Squad that had deeper, you know, heavier themed, more adult themes than even X Men, mm -hmm. and had more continuity than X Men. And so when Exosquad got picked up, I decided to roll my dice and go with Universal and do Exosquad instead of doing second season of X-Men. Ah, that's what happened there. Okay, because mm -hmm. I noticed you only did one season of X-Men. Yeah, and, uh, you know, it was overall a cordial departure with the network and everything where I kept consulting and uh, I worked on post on the show a little bit now and then. And uh, occasionally, you know, like they'd have a question for me about how to get something done and... And when I was working on Exo Squad, uh, one of the things they asked me to do when I was in Japan was to see if uh, Sunrise would be willing to take on X-Men because nobody was crazy for the animation. Mm -hmm. And so uh, while I was doing the Exo Squad pilot, I was also on an undercover mission to see if we get Sunrise to take over X-Men. Huh. Mm -hmm. And uh, that didn't work out because you know the Japanese studios were more expensive than the Koreans and X-Men had... Right really a very, very tiny budget, so we just couldn't work out the deal. Mm. But, but anyway, it, it just turned out that I had the chance to do Exo Squad, and it was the show that I had kind of been waiting to do, which was, mm. again, grown-up, serious science fiction, heavy continuity, all of those things. And I thought I had a chance to get it positioned with Fox to be the show following X-Men in the lineup. Mm -hmm. And we actually did have that chance, and it turned out the Universal Sales Department had taken ExoSquad into syndication a couple of days earlier than we had a, a feeler from Fox that they'd be interested in picking up the shows. Mm -hmm. And the TV division at Universal decided they didn't want to embarrass their sales staff by taking the show back, so we didn't pursue the Fox deal. Mm -hmm. And so that, that, for me, is like probably the biggest disappointment of my career, because I think had... X-Men led into Exo Squad, both shows would have uh, done better for it. Wow. 
well, they probably would have done better, but I'm not sure Exo Squad would have lasted as long as it did. I mean, Fox does have a reputation for killing things real quick. Well, those, those days, I think, you know, with X-Men as a lead, and we probably would have had at least a comparable run to Tick, which would have been two mm. or three seasons. Mm-hmm. Right. Hmm. And uh, that would have been fine, you know. They, you know, they actually, in the early days, they like the X-Men days and Killer Tomato days, they, they were willing to let shows have a little bit longer to, longer to to try out and build an audience. But like when I was doing Spider-Man Unlimited, uh, there'd been a huge change in management and management attitude. Uh, and so Spider-Man Unlimited got pulled after three weeks uh, because they had that Digimon show that was performing so well. Mm. And... Digimon was cheaper to produce, and they owned some of the merchandising on it. And so their goal that year, I believe, was just to clear as many time slots as possible for Digi- for Digimon. And so right. that was when stuff started getting canceled right and left, when Digimon mm. looked out for them. Mm. Okay. So going back to ExoSquad, so when ExoSquad was first planned, did you guys actually plan the story arcs and everything? Was that all planned right from the beginning, right to the end? Uh, well, not all the way to the end, but yes, there was a lot of stuff in place. Before I got there, uh, the show had been in development for quite a while, and uh, one of the first things they gave me was a binder. It was like one of those big studio binders that holds between 500 and 1,000 pages, and it's chock full of story ideas and uh, the background of the universe and designs and and I was, I fell in love with the story as uh, Jeff and Jeff Siegel and his team had developed it. And but the designs had kind of gone uh, wonky, where they wound up being kind of this generic Sid Mead thing. And I didn't think we'd make very good toys. And as it turned out, Playmates wasn't happy with them either, and brought their own own designs to the first meeting I was at. And they had like the JT E frame and the Alec De Leon E frame. And I go, you know, that's the show I want to do. I don't want to do this. I think that show has a chance to succeed, mm-hmm. I think the Sid Mead one is so generic it will fail. And mm-hmm. fortunately, they listened to me, and so we built out from those E-frames. So, so when you... one of those internet myths is that I created the show, when, well, I contributed a lot to it. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the, the skeleton, you know, the real core of it had been developed by Jeff and his guys before I got there, and I helped refine it, and Right. did a lot of the design on the show, but, but really Jeff should get the credit for creating the show. Hmm. Right. Now, did the show end, I guess you could say, on time? Like, is the ending the ending you guys wanted to have, or was there really intended to be more to the show? Well, we ended that initial storyline in the last episode. Uh, and the, the last episode, you might recall, the war's over, we kind of see what right. happened with everybody after the war. And then we introduced the new threat of the aliens coming in from outside the galaxy. Mm-hmm. And the idea was if we got a third season, uh, that the show would start going into new directions where we would be following our old cast, but there, we would also start following the uh, pirates and some of the other characters more. And so, mm-hmm. you know, it would continue to build on the same universe, but it would take it in different directions because that war was over. Right. But uh, what had happened is when the show went from weekly to daily, mm-hmm. Universal was new in the children's syndication market, and they didn't have the muscle to get the show with decent time slots. Right. So it performed okay, but it wasn't doing great business for them as a TV show, even though the toys were selling well. Mm-hmm. So they decided that they would rather uh, put their resources into you know, different things like the Land Before Time movies rather than continuing EXO. And so that was mm. the end of the show. Uh, but the toys were selling well, and so that's why you still saw EXO on TV for a couple of years, and why they were toy lines still building out from it for another two or three. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And has there been any call to revive EXO Squad since then? Uh, from time to time there has been, but Universal, uh, for some reason, just doesn't care for the show. Uh, okay. Uh, there, there's no other way to put it. Where I've actually had offers from from the, from some of the foreign studios or inquiries from them about either doing DVD releases or or doing some new animation, and uh, Universal just uh, ignores ignores when people knock on their door about it. Mm. And so 
uh, you know, a few years ago, the reason that they did the first season release was because when the show uh, started playing on Hulu, it was a huge hit for Hulu. It was one of their first breakout shows. Mm-hmm. And so Universal kind of felt pushed into doing the DVD. And, you know, typical because, you know, again, the show doesn't have a lot of fans inside the Universal organization. They didn't do a good DVD of it and they killed it. You know, or they packed, right. packed it like a little kid's show. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's very sad. <laughs> it is, you know, because yeah. Excel really is my favorite of all the shows I've done. Uh, mm. But you know, it, it was a it was a fun project to have done, and I'm still friends with all the people that worked on it. And you know, we we had a great time doing the show. We always wanted to do, and it was a once in a lifetime opportunity. Mm-hmm. Right. Because it Exo Squad kind of bumps up against something that I've, I've, I've wondered, and I've asked other people this. Um, when you look at somewhere like Japan, they're perfectly willing to do, like, action shows in that, that skewer high that they're for, for, like, an older an older audience. And we never quite seem to get there. We always seem to come right up to the edge of making that leap where we're able to do something like that. But well, we... Hmm? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, like, we mm-hmm. kind of hit that that place like in 1991 and 1992 where you had Batman, X-Men, Phantom 2020 and a couple of the other shows. Mm-hmm. And they were all, all of us were trying to push to do a more adult product. But even when you look at Batman, the, after the original incarnation of the show, it's all been skewed, you know, dumbed down. Mm-hmm. Now, where do you, do you think, does that, is that strictly, do you think kind of a bias from the top or, is it that the audience wouldn't get into something that was done a little more serious? Do you think? I think I think actually it's biased from the top because when you look at the ratings, like the the shows like X Men and the first Batman series got, uh, they've never been outperformed. And mm-hmm. when you look at when you look at shows like Digimon and Pokemon, the ratings they were getting, it's because you know even though they're designed. To, in juvenile way, the storylines are very mature and they have mm-hmm. continuity and they have character development and growth. Uh, but the people running stuff really haven't learned. Mm-hmm. Like Batman, X Men, Phantom, uh, and Exo, you see that there's an attempt to push the IQ of the shows up, and, mm-hmm. uh, and the ones that had good time slots and decent budgets succeeded. Yeah. Yeah, because like we, me and Rob both have like no people in animation, uh, they would have gotten into it, getting into, say, like, the 90s to the 2000s, and a lot of them made the statement that, um, to paraphrase, animation is run by people who hate cartoons. Yeah, and that's pretty much it, where there was a, you know, again, there was a, there was a brief golden age when, when, you know, like, uh, when I got in the business from the time I got in in 1978 to about 1995, 96, you could feel the shows getting smarter. Mm-hmm. And then something just happened where they started getting dumber again. Yeah. Uh, any idea why? No, I actually don't. Hmm. Because you're, you can, I can see it. If you look like, say, the, um, the early '90s, there were a lot of shows that, like I say, it looked like they didn't know where to go. Um, like another one I can remember was, uh, they did two Sonic the Hedgehog shows. There was a weekday one that was obviously like a kids show. And then the one on the weekend that it still seemed to skew young, but every now and then, yeah, they do these heavy stories about how traumatizing it was to get turned into an android or having your family murdered and stuff. Yeah, yeah that's the thing. Uh, you know, it, 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 it just depends on what people perceive the marketplace being rather than what the marketplace might actually be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, there is has been more open... Um, I guess you could say mature stories and violence since uh, stuff moved to Cartoon Network, for example. Some of the Cartoon Network shows definitely had more mature storylines. Mm-hmm. Um, and the last 10 years or so, we've actually seen quite a few different animated series that have taken new directions and have gone more in the anime route. Yeah. Uh, but that's because it's cable, of course. It's yeah. not on broadcast TV. Well, and I think you know, you're never going to see that, that again, where the, it was a different era and there was a different business around it you know like now that kids can see cartoons all the time you don't have the event programming like it used to be when there was a weekend 
or you knew there was a certain time after school that you had to catch your shows. Right. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and uh, yeah. and I think it's something that the whole TV business is struggling with, not just the kids' business, because you know the whole TV business used to be appointment viewing, mm-hmm. where you had to make a choice: you were going to watch that TV show then, or you would not see it. Right. But on the other hand, it's also loosened things up because now you could have more serial storytelling exactly oh, yeah. because people can go back and watch the early episodes anytime they want. Oh, yeah. Like I've I've just started watching Daredevil and, you know, it's wonderful. I mean, it's like what you would want a comic book TV show to be. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. OK, so here's a question, Will. What you've talked about some of your the highlights of your career. What's one of your greatest regrets? Do you have any regrets about uh, stuff that you worked on? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, probably my biggest regret is that god-awful Dragonlance movie that I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and sometimes it just happens. That, that stuff, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I, uh, that was an unfortunate case where the business just was not aligned properly to do good movie with it. You know, mm. or, uh, there were promises made about what the budgets would be and they were not fulfilled and mm-hmm. you know it was done so cheaply and in such a haphazard man- manner and uh, yeah I really felt bad for it because I liked the Dragonlance characters but mm-hmm. there was just no way you know, I was lucky that the movie got produced at all uh, let alone that I don't think there was ever a chance of it actually being well animated and as good as it should have been mm-hmm. And so, in hindsight, I really regret having taken that assignment. But it's one of those cases where sometimes you take something, you're contractually obligated to do it, and then by the time you realize that the problems with there are irresolvable, you're pregnant, you know, or you just right. finish them. <laughs> so, I think out of everything I've done in my career, that's that's my biggest regret. Hmm. Huh. I, I I can see that. Now, oddly enough, I could ask: Did you ever actually play Dungeons and Dragons? No. No, I I didn't. Wow. It, it's it's one of those things where I'm I'm a fan of like fantasy and science fiction, but mm-hmm. the I've never had time to, right. to take those huge <laughs> blocks of time it would take to play a role playing game. And well, so, yes, obviously, yeah. And so yeah. for for me, like that was a case of uh, I was relying on the people around me who were fans to make sure that right. we that we stayed true. And really, I think the screenplay on that was decent. And, the, mm-hmm. and, and one of the things I feel really bad about it is that the score is just wonderful. I mean, it's mm-hmm. probably the best scored, you know, video movie I've worked on, hmm. but, right. but the animation budget was probably about a fourth of what it needed to be to actually look like it should have. Right. Mm. Actually, you say you've never had time for role-playing games, now, but your art is sitting in a role-playing game source book, isn't it? The Dean Agents book for Villains of Vigilantes. Oh, yes. Yes, I... Uh, yeah, I, uh, I actually uh, helped set that deal up where... Mm-hmm. I'd seen that the, a lot of the role-playing game companies were doing superhero modules of the independent characters. Right. So I sent some Dean Agents books to a couple of them, and uh, the people doing Champions... Uh, mm-hmm. did that special issue of Champions with DNA Agents cover featured. And they never came across with a, with a deal in a timely manner. And Villains and Vigilantes uh, came across with a deal to do a dedicated module to us. And mm-hmm. so that's how we wound up doing VNV instead of Champions. Right. Wow. Because <laughs> that was actually my <laughs> first experience with uh, the DNA Agents. I actually learned about them and started reading the comic because of that source book. Yeah, I thought, you know, to to me, it just seemed like a natural thing to, to be in that market because there was, you know, particularly at that point, there were a lot of comic role-playing, you know, mm-hmm. games and modules, and it seemed like a place, a space that we could occupy. Hmm. And, yeah, I that... and I thought they did a really nice job with it, but, but again, we came out we came out a little too late in that cycle where I don't think that did the business they wanted or that we wanted because yeah. we came out just when that, phase of the business was uh, starting to go away. Yes, yeah. yes, it was, unfortunately. They were kind of wrapping up the whole Villains of Vigilante cycle at that point, like yeah. their yeah. product line, and unfortunately it came right at, towards the end, yeah. Yeah, but that said, I think it's I think it's a handsome book. I think, it, I think it's nice. I think it, it was nice, like, when we were working on the TV sales for it to, 
mm -hmm. to have that that and we had a t-shirt and we had some posters and things and it was really interesting because when we were doing tv pitches that convinced people that it was real oh okay wow the fact that there was actually this role-playing game book that yeah role-playing book with yeah, like, the, like there's a role-playing book, and we had some buttons, and we had a T-shirt, and we had some posters. Uh, suddenly, in their eyes, it looked like other people were investing in the show, in the property, so it looked like right. it might be more TV-worthy. Hmm. That makes total sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Again, it's just unfortunate it didn't happen. Okay. Yeah. Oh, believe me, it's unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I believe it. I believe it. Um, I suppose that's one of your other great regrets in your field is that you never managed to get a DNA agent's uh, TV show off the ground. Well, you know, it's always a bridesmaid, I'm afraid. <laughs> right. but, uh, well, I'm, su I'm you surprised know, you, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but you were in a director actual position for and producer position many times. Didn't you ever try to really push for your own project at, the, at those points? Uh, well, the business, I think, is different than people think it is. Mm -hmm. uh, like as a producer at Marvel, you know, I, I was a creative executive, not a business executive. You know, okay. I had, I could make decisions involving the show that they assigned me and were spending their money on. Okay. As okay. opposed to like in a movie where a producer is a money guy. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, those days being a producer was more like what you would call a showrunner, where where you run the show, but you don't have you're not the one paying people salaries. Mm. Right. And so. Like, for example, working at Marvel, you know, Marvel had had properties from Hasbro and from their own comics library. And uh, when we when they were hot doing TV shows, you know, everybody that had an action venture property would stop by Marvel to see if they would do a show. Yeah. So uh, comic had, had less chance. I mean, it was actually strange to me in a way that we were probably closer to getting a primetime live action show than we ever than we ever were to getting an animated show. Yeah, yeah, and, and doubly up because you know both Mark and I had very strong roots in animation, mm -hmm. but uh, but when people looked at it, they could the prime time people understood what it could be. Where animation, it was just another comic. Oh, okay. Because that's uh, have you uh, done anything recently with like the DNA agents or? No, I think both Mark and I, uh, you know, let's face it, we're both getting older and. I think we've both said what we have to say about the characters. Like we did uh, a big trade paperback of it for Image uh, about seven years ago or so, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, apart from occasionally doing something to keep the trademark active, that's probably it for it. I think uh, uh, as I become aware that I probably have a finite span of time left mm -hmm. to me, uh, if I'm going to work on something, I think I'd rather work on something new. And oh, right. you look at my career. Uh, as you can see, I've done a lot of stuff, and a lot of that is just because uh, the new project always appeals to me more than the old. Right. Okay. Wow. So, so you know, you can never say never. You know, something might happen if you <laughs> do something with it. But at this point, I think uh, it will exist as library rather than going forward. And part of my thought about that is just that it really is a period piece now where the things that were unique about it in the 1980s, you know, the corporate setting, the genetic manipulation that creates superheroes, we were one of the first strips to have both of those things. But now they're passe where they've been adopted by the mainstream media. Yeah, mm. that's true. Um, and even when we were doing it, uh, you know, like a good idea will, will just happen at the same time spontaneously from several sources because at the same time, we were selling DNA agents, Jack Kirby was selling Silver Star, and Dave Cockrum was selling Futurians, mm -hmm. and all three uh, corporate-controlled superheroes who are genetically altered to give them superpowers. Yeah, that's true. And we all came into existence within weeks, if not, you know, probably weeks or days of each other, you know, from the way that they got published. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. I can see that. Yeah. And so, again, like the stuff that was unique in 1980, you know, 2000, you've seen lots of movies about superheroes with genetically altered powers and right, yeah. that work for evil corporations. Yeah, yeah. I suspect at some point we're going to see that in the real world. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, yep. Probably sooner than we expect. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. <laughs>
Rob always so sneaks I... at the pressing line in. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry. I, I, I apologize. I'm, I'm uh, optimistic. It's, it's the cold <laughs> weather in Canada. Yes, exactly. It, it makes us uh, pessimistic optimists up here. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, well, outside of comics and animation, obviously, what things have inspired you the most? Like, what, are, you know, what, what uh, passions do you have outside of comics? Well, <laughs> well, to be honest, comics and science fiction uh, are the two main things that, that I've enjoyed most in my life. You know, uh, mm-hmm. so when I was a kid, um, I grew up in a very small town, but by fluke, uh, somebody had donated a library of 1940s, 1950s hardcover science fiction books to them. Mm-hmm. And so when I was a kid, I went on a program of uh, most weeks I would try to read five books a week. And I'd go through periods in the summer when I'd set the bar up to being 10 or 20 books a week. Mm-hmm. And so uh, vintage science fiction, definitely uh, a passion. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the other thing that, I, that strangely I always have had and love is cats. And so I have cats, I have reading, I have drawing. And then uh, I, I'm fortunate because, again, I had the love of my life enter my life when I was in high school. So for all of my adult life, I've had my wife as a companion, and we just love hanging right. out and doing stuff together. And, right. And so my life is just kind of naturally filled up with with as little as I do or as much as I do. Uh, I've mm-hmm. generally been pretty happy with the way stuff has gone. Wow. Yeah, one of the weirder things is now that I've retired from animation, like I still draw and I still mm-hmm. uh, play with doing stuff. Like right now I'm... I've just started doing uh, some ebook uh, reprints for the Amazon Kindle that you can buy on Amazon where I'm reprinting a bunch of the 1960s monster magazines whose publishers have gone out of business just to keep them in print because they were such a huge influence to me. Hmm. And then another project I've done for on Amazon is I have like a 500-page sketchbook called The Almost Unseen Artwork of Will Minio that shows some of the TV developments I've done on things like Speed Racer and other TV shows that didn't get made. Oh, wow. And so uh, I'm kind of pleased and excited with that. And so I'll mm-hmm. probably be doing more e-publishing this year. Um, that, combination of yeah. prints and sketchbooks and things. Well, that's the wonderful thing about e-publishing. Anyone can do it. You can well, just get your stuff out there. It is. And, you know, there's no overhead. Uh, you know, the only overhead is the time you take. It takes mm-hmm. to make them, and now that I'm retired, I've got the time. And then the other thing I've been doing yeah. in retirement that I never did in my real life is suddenly I'm learning how to be more of a handyman because I've always been in that position of not having the time to do work around the house and having the money right. to hire somebody else to do it. Mm-hmm. So now I'm learning how to paint, you know, houses, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, okay. our house and things, and do little repairs on the walls and that kind of thing. And I'm really enjoying it because I've never done it before. Huh. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's great. Well, some people when they retire they get into gardening. You're you're getting into being a handyman. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I still suck at it, but you know, hopefully, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Hopefully, in the years to come, I will progress and become a mature adult with normal adult skills. That eventually, yeah, you'll you'll reach your adulthood somewhere around the time you turn eighty or so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and uh, and again, right now. Uh, it's a weird thing, but through most of my life, I've not had leisure time, and and it just <laughs> amazes me that you know I can take off in the evening. Like uh, one of our favorite shows is Canadian show Murdoch, and like mm. oh, yes, we've binged Murdoch lately, and and uh, we enjoy the subtitled Japanese drama, so we've been going through those like Doctor mm-hmm. and uh, right now the big one in our house is a uh, Gene that's mm-hmm. based on a Japanese manga about a doctor who. Um, travels through time to the shogunate era and is trying to change history so his girlfriend in our present will survive and it's just an amazingly well-written show yes my wife watched that i my wife is a huge fan of korean and japanese dramas i haven't had the chance but yes she really loved it yeah but uh, but right now with the japanese dramas i'd recommend Jean, mm-hmm. and then another time travel one time taxi is just uh, brilliant writing 
Hmm. I don't know that one. Is that a Japanese drama? Yeah, I think they, I think you can see it on uh, both Crunch. Well, I know it's on Crunchyroll. It might be on Viki too, and you can see it free on either of them. I will go look that up. Time Taxi. Wow. Huh, yeah, I had no idea. Yeah, it's one of those shows that that's both funny and emotional and uh, just great casting. Hmm. Okay, very cool, very cool. And yeah, I'm a huge Murdoch fan myself, so I totally understand. I, I've just been catching up on season nine myself, and season ten is airing up here at the moment. Yeah, and they've just started showing some of season season ten in the States now. We've seen the first uh, five episodes. Now, where you're watching it, is it called the Murdoch Mysteries or the Artful Detective? Uh, well, when it when it goes out on cable, it's called Artful Detective, but on Acorn, uh, which is a streaming service that we have here in the States. I don't know if they have it in Canada. No, we don't. Uh, Acorn, uh, it streams under the Murdoch title. But, but Acorn here lets us see a lot of uh, the British library shows and Lately, they're starting to show some of the Norwegian detective shows as well, and then Murdoch, and there are a couple of shows from Australia, Australia they're showing, uh, and the one that, those that we're enjoying is 800 Words. I haven't seen that one. Okay, I'll, yeah. I'll have to take a look at that. Yeah, yeah. and uh, 800 Words is about a writer, and I really think it's probably the smartest show I've seen about, about a writer. Okay, I'll, oh. I'll look that up. Uh, they're probably also showing like the oh, was it Franny Fisher mysteries? I imagine too. Uh, we haven't gotten season three. Oh, you haven't gotten season three yet. Okay. Yeah, uh, and we really love that show, but uh, <laughs> we haven't announced that they're showing it on Acorn yet. So we may have to find an alternate source, like buying out of region DVDs or something. Right. Yeah, I think it's I think it's already aired up here in Canada. But you know, you know, we're part of the whole Commonwealth thing, so we get to see that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, one one last thing, actually. I noticed, because I've been following you on Facebook for a little while, and I noticed that you've done some sketches of, like, characters from, like, Gamera movies. I remember you were doing some, like, Gamera Girl sketches or something. Oh, yeah. Well, are you are you, are you you a big, like, kaiju fan? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. And again, kaiju, giant robots, all of that. Um, like, uh, my wife, Joe, is a quarter Japanese. and Oh, okay. And so uh, one of the things that, that we have enjoyed is going to Japan together. And mm-hmm. and so that's that's one of the reasons I got exposed to anime ahead of the curve is because of uh, my relationship with Joe and us going to Japan. And so when I went to Japan the first time, uh, I actually had one of those, one of those career-shaping moments because uh, I was working at Marvel on uh, Spider-Man and his amazing friends. And Marvel had a relationship with Toy back then. And so I said, look, I'm going to on vacation to Japan. Could you set me up to go to Toy? Because I'd just like to see it. Uh, mm-hmm. I admire so much what they do. And so they got a hold of the representative in Japan, Gene Pelk, and he set up for me to go to Toy. Mm-hmm. And so I went, I went to Toy as a tourist in 1981. And at that point, I was the first person from the American animation business who wasn't working on a project that actually went to toy just to meet them. And, and over the years, uh, people at toy remembered that I was the guy that cared enough to come and say hi. And so I got, I got taken on, on a tour of the studio and they were working on the Dr. Slump movie. And oh. I was looking at the Dr. Slump movie and I was admiring the storyboards and, uh, one of their directors and translator was giving me the tour and I was talking about how wonderful the storyboard was and I want to know who the artist was. And he goes, well, here, through the translator, of course, here we don't call them storyboard artists, we call them storyboard writers because they're the ones writing the continuity of the movie. Right. And that kind of stuck with me when I got back to this. I go, you know, really, when I do a storyboard, I don't want to just illustrate it, I want to actually write it. I want to be active in... Mm -hmm getting more information about the story across. And that's when it kind of shaped my philosophy that I was the one responsible for portraying what the emotion of the character was at the moment. I was the one responsible for making sure that everything hooked up, even if it didn't hook up properly in the script. And so I decided from that point, I would be a storyboard writer rather than a storyboard artist. Mm. And so uh, when you look at my work as a storyboard person, uh, it's one of the things I think 
that made my work stand out at that, at that time was that I just did more than other people to make sure that the story was entertaining for the audience. Right. Hmm. Yeah, that, I can see that. I can see how that would really show through. Hmm. Now, did you ever get to meet any of the uh, major Japanese like creators or animators? Uh, well, I worked with uh, Yasuo Otsuka, who was the guy who, dis who discovered Miyazaki. Mm -hmm. And not, yeah, and so it was, yeah, it was, it, uh, when I was working, I worked for a while at Sunrise on the Little Nemo movie, and I worked with quite a few of the big guys on that. Wow. Uh, right. But there was a little separation where I got to know Otsuka fairly well. Right. Uh, but the other guys, you know, were just kind of doing their thing, and we were doing our thing. <laughs> that was really a mess of a project, but uh, but but yeah, I've I've met a few of them. Like I met uh, Dezaki in passing. Uh, mm -hmm. You know when uh, they were doing a show called Power Masters at TMS, and I met uh, the guy that created Big O uh, when I was doing a uh, a uh, a uh, speed racer development for uh, the speed racer company here in the states. Right. And so I've met a few of them, but but I don't really. You know, their business is so different. Like, I don't, didn't really know any of them well. Hmm. Right, right. Yeah, you didn't you know, get a chance. Like, uh, like, I knew the people that they had doing export productions, you know, right. as opposed to the guys doing their theatricals and things. Now, were you ever tempted to actually take a posting in Japan? Because I know sometimes we'd send our animators over there to oversee projects or things like that. Well, that somehow that never came up because uh, of my value as a, you know, because besides producing and directing, I was actively involved in series development and design and generally involved in the writing. And so uh, I, I kind of missed that that spot in the business that somebody would send me over to supervise. Mm. Right. I guess you were just, you were too valuable. They couldn't, they couldn't send you over there and risk losing you in a giant monster attack. Well, well, yeah, just to, you know, functionally didn't make, didn't make any sense. But yeah, like, a, you know, normally when you do a show, you go over for a week or two and hang out at the studio and work with them mm -hmm. on on paper and things. And that was always fun. Right, yeah, I bet it would be. And uh, and there was a point strangely involving Dragonlance where in, I think it was in 1988, when I was between seasons of uh, Ghostbusters, uh, Toy had made a tentative deal to do a um, Dragonlance feature with Katakawa, who was the Japanese right. publisher. Oh. And... Uh, it, again, it was one of those cases where I came up as the person everybody thought they could work with, and so I was offered a chance to direct a uh, Dragonlance feature in Japan, and I would have been the first American director to do a, a Japanese animated movie. But um, there were problems in the interaction between TSR and Katakawa, and about that time, there was that scandal with Katakawa's publisher being involved in some illegal activities, and the thing just fell apart. So I wound up doing another year of Ghostbusters, mm. <laughs> doing Dragonlance, and that project just died. But that was pretty. Again, it was one of those things that was heady days where I thought I was headed towards Japan to direct a feature there. Huh. Right. Oh, that would have been so amazing. Oh. Yeah, it would have been a very different movie than the one that we wound up doing. Like, what? Twenty three years later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah, uh, would have been would have actually been relevant at that time instead. Yeah, it would have been relevant, and plus it would have had uh, Japanese animation, which I think would have been mm -hmm. uh, really much better for it. Mm. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, you might even have built beat Record of Lotus War to the air at that point then too. Yeah. 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 yeah you would have, and so you would have actually produced pretty much the first D and D animated thing that came out. Well, besides the. The Saturday morning series, of course. Yeah, yeah. and that had actually that had actually started out not as Dungeons and Dragons. Like we'd been developing a show called Magic. What was it? it? Wasn't Magic and Monsters? That was a movie. But it was something else that was a parallel to Dungeons and Dragons. That so we did a lot of development at Marvel before they got the actual rights. Mm -hmm. You worked on the original Dungeons and Dragons cartoon, the Saturday morning one. Uh, development, like before it was Dungeons and Dragons. And then they actually got the rights to do Dungeons and Dragons when I was off doing the comic book. When I was off right. doing okay. Steve Nathan's comic. But yeah, we, we had uh, probably spent about three or four months off and on developing a Dungeons and Dragon-like property before they secured the rights mm. to the actual thing. And uh, okay. 
many of the characters that were developed for the project that was not unlike Dungeons and Dragons wound up being in the Dungeons and Dragons show. Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah, so I had no idea. Yeah, it it wasn't D and D. So they they kind of just sort of when they got the official rights, just sort of fudged it over to a D and D show. Yep. Well, that explains a lot. It wow. Does. Holy smokes. Okay. Yeah, that that that's yet another thing that's come up today that explains something from like way back in my childhood. <laughs> well, everything has reasons, but they're not always obvious. Yeah. Mm. Wow. Wow, Will, you have been filling in so many gaps in our childhood, and I'm sure for our audience as well. I really appreciate you coming on to do this. This has been fantastic. Yeah, okay. I had a good time, and you know, like I like I mentioned when we were on Facebook. Uh, I enjoyed your interview with Ben Dunn, and I thought it seemed like it would be a good project to take on. Oh, no, and we really appreciate you coming yeah. on. This is, yeah, this has been fantastic. And you are definitely welcome to come on again anytime you want. If you want to, if there's a particular topic you want to talk about, just let us know, and okay, we'll, well, we'll be happy to have you on again. Well, yeah. if I ever get off my butt and do something new, I'll <laughs> give you a call. Okay, sure. We'd love, to, we'd love to do that. Don, did you have any last questions before we sign off? Well, there's one um one odd thing. Uh, that you mentioned, you mentioned um, the Japanese influence. Um, I had a couple friends that way back in the day, they were huge fans of like the Gem and the Hologram show. Yes, and and a lot of people were, and it's interesting because a few of them got into Japanese stuff a little while later because we'd watch it, and I said, "This is all like a Japanese like animated soap opera." And then when those became available, they were curious, and that's what got them into the Japanese stuff was specifically that show. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, my my all-time favorite anime is Udo Seyatra. That's one of the things Ben and I have in common. <laughs> and one of the reasons and we became too. friends. Yeah. And, uh, and when I started doing Gem, uh, because I'd been doing titles for Marvel, uh, I had that ability to get a story without script mm-hmm. rolling mm-hmm. in the titles and things. I started doing the music videos on Gem. And when they assigned me to be the producer and director with them, the thing that I gave the other artists to understand what I wanted to do was I had a, a title reel of Urusi Atra that had all of the opening and closing credits <laughs> for like the first eight seasons of the show or so. Uh-huh. And, mm-hmm. and that was my primer for them to learn how to think that way. And that you was know. for the, for like the videos? Uh-huh, for the videos, yeah. And so when you look at the gem title, like there's a lot of stuff in it that's unique for an American show, but a lot of those were things huh. I drift off of uh, the Ruseatra t- titles, you know, particularly like the first two seasons. Holy smokes! Yeah, you know, <laughs> Cosmic the Cosmic Cycler had a lot of influence on the way that I decided to handle the gem graphics. That again, again, that explains something that I never thought of and because I was more into like ultraviolet stuff, but I saw a bunch of them with, with friends of mine and holy smokes. Yeah. I can totally see that. Yeah. Now I have to go back and watch those again. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's funny now there are, now that all of the Urusi Atras are available with subs pretty much on YouTube. I have to say I'm disappointed in the writing where I imagined much better stories when I was <laughs> watching them without subs. Right. <laughs> Uh, but that said, it, it was a hugely influential show to me. And mm-hmm. and again, like my friends uh, who were working on the gem songs with me, some of them were already fans, and then other people I turned on to it trying to teach them how to think abstractly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, Beautiful Dreamer would definitely make people think abstractly. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. The, <laughs> yeah the, for, for me, again, like a lot of things with the Bruce Atra, it's the first two or three seasons that, that are good, and then everything else, they kind of ran out of concept. Mm. Mm. So, one final thought. So, Will, do you have any advice for young people who are trying to enter, like, the uh, comics or animation field? Wow. Uh, both fields have changed so much since I was active in them that mm. that's very different in the business sense. But creatively... I would say it's very important uh, to read a lot. And uh, like I mentioned to you, like when I was a kid, I had a regular program of reading five books a week. Uh, and then like through summer, sometimes I could get up to 10 or 20 books a week just so mm-hmm. I learned more about story. And then the other thing is 
to be a writer or an artist, you need to be incredibly disciplined. You know, like there'll be times when you want to go out and have fun with people and you need to take that time and spend it by, you know, at the drawing table or, or the keyboard. Uh, right. You know, it, it's not the kind of work anybody just hands to you. You know, where you actually, mm. you actually have to, to learn how to do a, a level of level of work good enough that people will be interested in what you do. And so it's, uh, you know, learn your basics. Like you're going to be a writer, uh, do, you know, take some time, study grammar, learn how to construct a sentence, learn how to construct a plot, learn how to pitch things. And if you're an artist, you know, take the time to figure out how to draw stuff. Like uh, as an artist, if you're constant, if people are criticizing your art and you're constantly knocked back to a position of saying, I, that's because that's my style. Uh, it's not because it's your style. It's because you've limited yourself artistically so much that that's the only thing you can draw. Hmm. Because uh, I, I would like, as you've seen on Facebook, I draw a lot of different stuff. And, a lot of, and mm -hmm. you know, through my career, I've drawn a lot of different styles. You know, everything from spy dogs to the exo squad uh, e frames and you know, things. And you shouldn't be scared to take on things that are outside your comfort zone. And it's and it's good for you to learn how to draw a variety of things and not walk in too fast. That I'm always going to draw this way. Hmm. Right. Yeah. I think that's great advice. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and also, um, my friend, uh, basically, okay. it's just you need to be focused on what you're doing. And then the other thing mm -hmm. that sometimes people forget is you need to be a decent human being. Hmm. You need to treat people with kindness, not speak cruelly of people behind their backs. You need to, you know, you need to man up and be a decent human to succeed in the long haul. Huh. Well, yes, because especially in this something like the animation industry, right? I mean, yeah. having good relationships is important because it's a small town. Yes. You basically, everyone knows everyone, right? Uh, uh, yeah, very much so. And so, yeah, try, try to be nice. No, and I think that's something that many people forget is that, yeah, the human element of it, especially yeah. these days. Yeah. yeah. Do you think, though, so, if someone wanted to succeed in animation or become part of the animation industry, do they still have to move out to Los Angeles, for example? Uh, I think it depends on what you want to do. Uh, there's, again, a lot of the studios now prefer to have you working in-house. And so I think that there's an advantage of being in a metropolitan center. Like uh, Los Angeles certainly would be good. And, mm -hmm. and it used to be that there was a bit of a business in Vancouver and some in Toronto and yeah. Canada. I'm not sure if that's still mm -hmm. the case. But, there still is. There but, still is. But, uh, but it always helps to be where the work is. Mm, right. Like my experience with comics, like, you know, I mentioned how when they had a cutback, I got, I was like one of the first people laid off in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And later on, about 10 years later, when I was working at Marvel Productions and John Romita came out and we were chatting one day, he goes, you know, there are a lot of people at Marvel who really liked your stuff. If you would just come to New York, you would have had work. And it didn't occur to anybody to tell me that. <laughs> because it was just so obvious to them and they didn't know I was a hick from the sticks that didn't know that would be the case. Right. And so, yes, if you can afford to, to get close to the work that you desire to participate in, you probably should. Right. No, I, I think that's solid advice. And then after you're established, then, you know, it's easier to work remote, like uh, over the internet and things. Like, for example, my friend Rick Hoberg, again, uh, moved up to Washington in the late 80s, and he's never been short work because he established himself as being a reliable artist who you right. depend on. Hmm. I think that's a big part of it, too, isn't it? Being a professional and being someone that others know they can rely on and then know they can trust. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, that that is a lot of it. It's, it's that old professional behavior, like... Uh, Try to meet all of your deadlines, and if you can't meet a deadline, be upfront. Let people know ahead of time that you're not going to make it, and why, so that they have a right, chance yeah. to do alternative planning if they actually need the stuff on the day they've told you. Right. Hmm. Okay. Well, at two hours, we'd probably better call this night. <laughs> okay. Before, before keeping Will up. Um, so, so again, thank you very much, Will, for coming yeah. on. Yeah. Uh, I fun really talking. appreciate it. Oh, it's been fun talking with you, man. It's been really great talking with yeah. you. Yeah. And um, 
All right, everyone, thanks for listening, and, and tune in in two weeks when we'll have another awesome show for you, which will probably involve Don crying about something. Yeah, probably. Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the show. If you'd like to hear more or join the conversation, come visit us at ObeyTheDNA.com. You can also find us on iTunes or whatever fine podcast site forgot to lock their back door. So until next time, remember that to master the nerdly arts takes time, practice, and enough Coca-Cola to drop a rhino. See ya! Come on over and join the conversation at ObeyTheDNA.com, where you will find show notes and more.